All right, so before we read our text, um, I just want to remind us a bit of where, what we're doing, where we're going. And some of us might remember this chart or this graphic that uh, is our kind of a, an overall uh, picture of our vision 2028, where we see God specifically calling us, um, as we saw last week, to be an alternate community within our community. This very much applies to wherever you are. If you're in a different state, this is what you want to work toward as well as we look at God's word. We will truly be light for the darkness, and here's a couple of excerpts from the narrative of this vision that God has for us. One is that we will turn from our paths of self-centered, tiny world busyness to join a shared path of others-centered kingdom sacrifice. And then as well, here's another excerpt from the overall narrative, the overall vision. Uh, We want to pursue a gospel-centered discipleship pathway that will train us for organic outreach and compel us to relentlessly pursue and draw people in who are wandering in the darkness of anxiety, loneliness, discontentment, and that list goes on and on. And so you can see that visual representation of this vision again on the screen. We're working toward the someday of God's beautiful kingdom exploding into our community through an everyday focus on the gospel, through an everyday focus on making disciples. And so, again, this is why we are focused on Francis Chan's book called Multiply, which is all about becoming increasingly equipped to be disciples who truly, effectively make disciples. And so now we're learning some of the bare essentials for understanding the gospel and sharing the gospel, communicating it uh, to those around us. And as we read our text this morning, it's helpful to understand that in order to accommodate and communicate with his people, God used the spoken word of intermediaries, if you remember, like Moses, the prophets, priests. But God also used the drama of sacrifices to boldly communicate to his people. I've always hunted, I've always fished, and grew up on a farm with all kinds of animals, uh, my, my grandfather, uh, my uncles, in the early days of my life, they had a butcher shop. Uh, and uh, sometimes I remember they would also just go ahead and butcher an animal uh, right inside our garage uh, on the farm. And um, <clears throat> we did a variety of animals, and, and it, it was bloody. It was messy. And one of the things I remember is that there were all kinds of odors. It seems that every kind of bird and animal, you, 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 some of you are thinking, what is wrong with this guy? How can he be talking like this? But when you cut into an abdomen of various animals, they all have a different distinct odor. And even the organs have different odors. And the point is that as people made these required offerings and sacrifices, their senses would have been overwhelmed. And their minds, through all of this, would be jolted as they killed and butchered a variety of animals. And then they sprinkled and smeared blood all over the altar. And then they uh, would cut out and burn up the sizzling fat on the altar. And the idea here was to demonstrate, all of this is to demonstrate that sin against God requires the steep price of death. And the animal would pay the price. Now today, God relates to us, uh, and I know many of you are glad for this, no longer through sacrifices, but through his written word and through his word preached. And so we are reading a portion of Isaiah's prophecy that will help us to see that ultimately all of those animal sacrifices were, they were ineffective. Nothing really changed for centuries. And so God provided another way, a way that still very much applies to us today. And the bottom line is we still need a sacrifice. 
And so we're going to read it in our text and see how this sacrifice is provided for us and what it does for us. So read with me. The text is too long to put on the screen today, and so hopefully you have a Bible with you and you can open it up to Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, or his descendants, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And now we go to chapter 54, verse 1. Sing, O barren one, who did not bear Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. You, for you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. So that ends the reading of God's holy word. So the multiply chapter this week is all about Old Testament sacrifices, how they worked and yet didn't work. And so I chose this text today, sometimes called the Gospel of the Old Testament, so that we can see that there is one ultimate sacrifice that works in studying ways to bring about the transforming power of the gospel. As we look at this text, we're going to see how gospel transformation works in especially two ways. Uh, We get a synectomy and a heart transplant. So let me explain about the first one. Uh, Yes, this is what I said, synectomy. You can Google the word, and you won't find it anywhere. I know, because I just made it up. Ectomy is a medical term that refers to the surgical removal of something. And so you have the lumpectomy, you have a tonsillectomy, you have an appendectomy, and today we have a synectomy. Very simply, the removal of sin. And let me explain to you why the synectomy is so important. 
First of all, Isaiah 53 is a famous chapter. It's the most quoted text in the New Testament, but it is also controversial. It is shocking because it doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't make sense. And, that, and that's the case for a few different reasons. Um, it refers to a Messiah who would be vi- whose death would be violent, substitutional, and voluntary. Now, violent, beginning in Exodus, there are multiple Old Testament prophecies that point to a Messiah or a prince who would one day bring God's shalom, peace, and justice back to the world. And is again, if you go through the book of Isaiah in chapters 40 and 42 and 50, you see a servant who is going to come with great power, bring salvation to the nations. It all sounds great. It all makes sense until you get to our text. This Messiah servant who is going to bring an end to violence and justice is instead on the receiving end. And he becomes the victim of violence and justice. If you look at verse 8, he was cut out cut off out of the land of the living. And that refers to a violent, horrible death. As well, he was pierced for our transgressions. In verse 5, it means he was pierced right through from the front to the back, uh, to the back of his body. And so it's all about this excruciating death. And so one thing that comes up out of this then is how could it make sense that the servant who's going to bring an end to the world's brokenness, violence, injustice, will be broken under violence and injustice? The text also doesn't make sense because it becomes clear through several phrases that it will be a substitutional death. Now, a number of us, probably the most common way that we understand substitute is with sports. So, for example, a week ago, Kansas City Chiefs star quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, he suffered a concussion, had to be taken out of the game, and the Chiefs nation, they're holding their breath. How can they win? But they had a substitute. And Chad Henney wonderfully carried the day, led the win. In verse 10 of our text, it says that the Lord will make this servant's life a guilt offering. And with a guilt offering, an animal's death served as a substitute punishment for the sinner who made the offering. And the problem here is that Human sacrifice was always condemned, and yet the text is clear in verse 5. For example, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And so the servant becomes a guilt offering. And then as well we see in verse 4 when it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. It is made clear as well that... His death is voluntary. It's deliberate. He willingly lays down his life. I have a good friend who has suffered horribly throughout his life so that he has repeatedly considered suicide. But he also keeps coming back to, because he knows the Bible well, that the Bible strongly forbids it. And it holds him back over and over. And so how can this servant of the Lord willingly surrender his life? Well, one way to make sense of it is to put the pieces together like the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8. He looked at this same path. A couple of weeks ago, Ruth and I drove home from Florida 20 hours straight. We thought that was brutal. Took us a day or two or more to recover from that. But that's nothing compared to this staggering, long, difficult, dangerous journey that the Ethiopian in this story has made in order to worship God in the temple. And now... As we pick up the story, he is heading back. 
And he, before he headed back, he apparently stopped at the temple bookstore and picked up the book of Isaiah. And <clears throat> he is reading the scroll of Isaiah. Now, this man is a high-ranking official in charge of the treasury for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. He would have had a lot going for him. But clearly something is wrong. And there could only be one reason that he would make such a crazy, arduous journey to go worship in a strange place. He is desperately seeking to satisfy some deep spiritual longings in his soul. And then listen, he would have been heading back after he would have been rejected from entering the temple. After all that, because Mosaic law required that nothing, no one deformed or diseased could go into the presence of God. And in those days, any official or staff member who worked closely with a royal family, they would have been required to undergo castration. It was a horrible price to pay especially when having descendants in that culture, it was everything. And so you can imagine now his disappointment here is unimaginable, but he's still searching, he's still reading. And the story says that Philip is directed by an angel to go find this man, go this way on this road, and he does indeed find him, and he joins him up in his chariot, and he hears him reading Isaiah 53, our text. And it's recorded in Acts chapter 30 this way. It says that Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up, sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. So when you look at the <clears throat> phrase there, who can describe his generation, it means that there, there was no generation. There, the, he he had to give up having descendants. And so imagine what this must have been like for a man who had just been turned away from the house of God because he didn't have descendants. And yet here is this servant of the Lord who is voluntarily taking this condition on. And then I love this part, beginning in verse 34. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's about the good news of Jesus. It's about the gospel. And when we see Jesus, we see the answers to all these problems or contradictions that seem to bubble up from the text. First, we are forbidden to choose suicide because God is the one who gives us life. It's not our decision about when to end that life. But God's life is his own. And he has laid it down for us. And we also understand how Jesus becomes our substitute. Just yesterday, I had a church family member here told me how she grieved over a member of her family who remains stubbornly bitter and will not forgive her. You see, anytime someone horribly wrongs you, you can choose bitterness or forgiveness. And it's been said, I love this one, Bitterness is a poison that we swallow while we wait for the other person to die. See, if you choose bitterness, you will suffer, and you will essentially wither away and die. 
But if you choose forgiveness, you also suffer. When you want to pay somebody back for the wrong they've done and then don't pay them back, in order to do that, you have to painfully swallow it yourself and pay it yourself. And when you want to make them suffer, but you don't make them suffer because you choose to forgive them, then you do suffer. You absorb it. Real forgiveness always involves suffering. And sometimes it is agonizing. And if that is true with our minuscule sense of justice, how much more should that be true for the holy God of the heavens and the earth? And this is what the Ethiopian eunuch sees. That this God is suffering in order to forgive us. If God is not going to pay us back, he had to pay. And when the eunuch realized this and he sees this, it changes everything. It changes his life. He sees that God underwent a violent um, death in our place, voluntary, so that he could be forgiven and receive him. So here's why it changes his life. Here's why it changes our life. This is how the gospel works to transform us. The gospel reveals the stunning, costly grace of God. You see, God, we know, and you see it throughout. This is one of the reasons why the, you did, we did have the animal sacrifices, to show that there must be, be justice. God is infinitely holy, and at the same time, he is infinitely loving. And God's grace, it melts your heart when you realize that he is so holy, he can't just shrug off your evil, but he's also so loving that he couldn't punish you for it. So now what does this say about us? Well, number one, You are a mess who is so ugly and corrupt that a holy God had to die for you. And so what this also means is that when you even slightly look down on others who don't quite meet your standards, and we have that all the time, don't we? It means you have forgotten what a sinful mess you are. Now, at the same time, what this all means for us is that you are a son or daughter of God who loves you so much he was glad to die for you. And with that kind of love and affirmation, you never have to look down on yourself again. And when you see what it costs God to Uh, remove your sin, you are set free from feeling inferior or superior to anyone. Look at that again. When you see what it costs God to remove your sin, you are set free from feeling inferior or superior to anyone. And the more that you see how God's holiness and infinite love is revealed on the cross, the more it will melt, it will transform you. That's what a synectomy does for us. We're set free like the the eunuch to go on our way with joy every day. Now, we also get a heart transplant. And we see this beginning in chapter 54, verse 1. Sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. We need to understand here, as th- in order to understand this text, that childbearing in these cultures meant everything. Children provided income and labor for the family farm the, uh, or the family business. They provided security, status. 
the more children, the more you could be provided for in the future. Children where your social security, your retirement fund, your retirement care. And since the survival rate for children in those days was so low, you would need to have eight or ten to maybe still have three remaining in your latter years of dependence. Children were also the key to survival for your tribe or your city. And so if your tribe didn't have more children than the neighboring tribe, they could raise up a larger army and come and conquer your tribe. And so there was this strong community obligation to have as many children in the po as possible. Basically, in the ancient Near East, a woman who bore many children was highly valued. But this is what also happens. We naturally turn good things into ultimate things. Tim Keller, in an article for the Gospel Coalition, offers this definition of sin. He said this, Sin isn't only doing bad things. It is more fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than God. Whatever we build our life on will drive us and enslave us. Sin is primarily idolatry. So when we think about these ancient Near Eastern people, we have a picture in our minds, uh, you know, those crazy people bowing down to wooden and stone uh, idols. But in those ancient cultures, and even in our culture today, family was often an ultimate thing and thus an idol. So if family and children were ultimate things, then women who couldn't have children because of maybe a physical limitation, they would be devastated. As it says in 54 verse 1, they are desolate. They felt abandoned, worthless. Back in Genesis 30 verse 1, when Rachel couldn't have children, she said, give me children or I'll die. That summed it up for that culture. Now, for us, we look at that, that seems crazy. But we have our own cultural pressures today. How about the pressure to maintain a certain appearance or to be thin? My guess is women didn't suffer through eating disorders in those days. And kids come under tremendous pressure to maintain the grades so they can get into the right school and they can get into the career and are they pressure to get on the varsity team or to be, a certain group, be with a certain group of friends. And what you find in scripture is that everyone struggles under burdens that are imposed by their culture, imposed by your group of friends, imposed by the greater culture. Every day there are objects that are dangled out in front of us and the message for us always is this, if you have this, if you don't have this, you have no worth, you have no significance or value. If you're watching t the football games today, watch the commercials. They'll tell you over and over, if you don't have these things, you got to have these things. And so, for example, in our culture, your value depends on your appearance with clothes and career and income and cars and house. For Rachel, childlessness was a psychological and social death, and it seems so harsh, but the reality is if you build your identity on anything other than God and you fail to get it, it is psych psychological and social death. And I have seen and counseled with people over and over who have gone through this. My sinful heart is already inclined toward wandering eyes. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And then my culture offers up a thousand alternatives to God every day. And so if your heart and life revolves around shopping and stuff, the result will often be that your finances will be out of control. Or another way to think about it is this. Your internet history, your credit card and, and your bank statements, they are a window into what are the real affections, the real loves of your heart. 
About a year ago, I had a friend confess on social media that he had allowed work to dominate his life and he was asking for forgiveness because he had horribly ignored and hurt his family and his friends. Nancy Ortberg wrote this. She said, I have a dear friend who is in a marriage that is hard, just plain old hard. And rather than face the pain of the hard, she escapes for hours in the day into a fantasy world that is starring another man in her church who doesn't know how she feels about him, so she feels like it's safe. But it is an amazing amount of time she daydreams and thinks about this person. Sexual idolatry could take a turn where it's not fantasy, but something like pornography, and it's got such a grip on you that you know full well it is an idol for you, and you don't know how to get it out of your life. And it competes, and it obscures who God is. C.S. Lewis says it in a fascinating way. I put it on the screen. This is what he says. You can get a large audience together for a striptease act. That is, to watch a girl undress on a stage. Now suppose you went to a country where you could fill a theater simply by bringing a covered plate onto the stage and then slowly lifting the cover so that everyone could see just before the lights went out that it contained a lamb chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that something had gone wrong in that country and their appetite for food? Absolutely. And so this is what we think about. Where have your desires for good things gone haywire and become a substitute for God? Or what do you daydream about? What has captured your heart and life more than God? Think about that as we go through this coming week. Here's what I see from my own heart sometimes, and, and I see it as well for many others. If I have some good cable TV, a little love, an easy chair, some good times with the hobbies, a little internet surfing, sports, friends, beer, and pizza, who needs God to be at the center? Really? And when our culture and media offer a thousand carrots, and our friends are in the same rut, Man, it's hard to get free. But now again, this is where the gospel comes in. And this is how we get a heart transplant with the freedom to love what is truly valuable. God says there is a way out. There is freedom from this slavery and this chasing after these objects. This is why he says these words in the text. He says, sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, Look what he's saying. What he's saying is, I can get you to sing without children. That's, that's radical, especially for this culture. I understand that you are under severe pressures to conform, and you suffer shame when you don't, but... I am giving you an emotional freedom and an emancipation from men, all the pressures from men and from your family and from the shame and whatever other pressures are bearing down on you. And then look at the end of 54 verse 1. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. So look at this. What does that mean? The woman who never has any children has more children than the woman who has a lot of children. What does that mean? Well, again, here's what we need to see. Children in those days represented value, worth, beauty, honor. And so God is saying that value, worth, beauty, and honor are yours apart from children. And that's so radical for that culture. And for us today, what that means is that value, worth, beauty, and honor are yours apart from the stuff that will captivate your heart and clutter your life. 
And here's the source of this radical message. It's in verse 5. For your maker is your husband. Your maker is your husband. And again, what you find here and throughout Scripture, it's similar to what we saw last week. The default of our hearts, the default of other religions, is that we will try harder and try harder and try harder to live up to certain standards. And then maybe at the end of your life, if you lived up to those standards pretty well, you'd get the reward of your good efforts. But Christianity through the gospel is radically different. Marriage is the beautiful metaphor given here so to show that you are united to God through Christ and you have your acceptance, your significance, and your approval when? Now. You have it already. And as soon as you say, I do to him, you don't have to try your best to be his bride. You have the praise and the delight of your husband, God himself, today. So here's the truth that we can see in this amazing passage. Stop looking to all these other things. I can be your supreme value. What greater value could you possibly have than to be delighted in and sacrificed for by the maker of the universe? God wants us to enjoy all these things. He does. They're wonderful gifts from him. But don't make them ultimate things. And when Jesus becomes your ultimate value, you're freed to enjoy everything else. In the wintertime, when we go to bed, in the fall, we always say, is this the week we're going to put on the flannel sheets? Is this the week we're going to put on the heated blanket? And um, I think we're getting a little softer every year because it comes out pretty early. And we love those flannel sheets, and we love the heated blanket together. And, and so we curl up into that on a cold night, and that sleeps well, baby. It sleeps well. All of that to say this, we are set free only when our hearts are refreshed and rest in Christ. And the way that you rest in a warm bed on a cold winter night after an exhausting day. Rest in him. He will provide. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we are so grateful for the way that you do indeed provide for us, the way that you do indeed provide this gospel transformation through the substitute, through the sacrifice that was made for us in our place. Thank you for freeing us from all the things that distract us. And we pray that we would indeed be free. Father, forgive us for making all of these things sometimes, indeed, more important than you. Maybe it's the combination of all those things. Forgive us. And make us a people who say, I do. People who who commit to you and revel in the joy that is ours through your salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.